Some of my favorite people in the world are startup founders. They've got so much energy, so much vision, so much positivity. They all have the ability to look at a problem and imagine possible solutions. And it's really fun to hang out with them. They're just like a bundle of energy. And I've worked with many startup founders in my career. And the things they want to focus on are things like, you know, market fit and finding co-founders and getting funding and cap tables and strategy, go to markets and minimal viable products and all that stuff. Today's guest, uh, Diva Ramachandran, is a coach and advisor to startups, and she helps them focus on things that they don't really think they need to, know, to focus on, things like energy and clarity. So what are the internal states that allow someone to create big things in the world? In our conversation, we cover this. We talk about her experiences working with uh, startups in Silicon Valley, where she lives, and around the world. And whether you're going to do a startup or you're a startup founder, or you just want to have the resources, the inner resources to make a big difference in the world in a positive way, I think this will be a really helpful conversation. So without further ado, Divya Ramachandran, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here, Howie. I'm excited to talk to you because you are doing what I consider um, sacred work, which is helping people birth new things into the world. Um, and God knows we need, we need new things, new ideas, new solutions. And um, I guess my first, first question, you maybe just, just, you know, I said it in a way that's maybe a little weird and poetic, but uh, how, well, how do you describe what you do? I love the way you said it, actually. Maybe I'll start using that. I, um, in a nutshell, I help startups do hard things. Um, and specifically, I'm working with startup leaders and startup teams to help them find clarity to do the hard work they need to, to, as you said, bring new ideas into the world. Hmm. So, yeah, I, was, I also want to jump, jump right in on that. So har hard things, um, wh why don't they have... Clarity. I mean, you know, a company, you know, it's no small thing to do a startup. You you know, you drop everything else. You, you, you know, you see a big problem. You want to solve it. Where is there lack of clarity in that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so it's such an interesting question. I've never thought about it that way. I mean, I personally, I moved into this role as a coach to work with startups after having worked at multiple startups before. So I can maybe say from experience that a few things really define what the environment feels like at a startup. And specifically, I'm talking about tech startups because that's my background. Um, okay. But I think this is pretty common across the board. Um, and one is that there is the, the pace at which one is expected to create outcome, out, out, like outcomes and results is just, mm -hmm. it's just, high it's very high um, and the expectation is just really coming from the fact that you have limited funds limited resources and so it's like how much can we do with the limited stuff that we have and mm. how quickly can we create results to then get to the next level and it doesn't help of course that there's so many startups that have become raging successes in very short periods of time so everyone kind of wants that and wants to be that as well and so there's just this overall expectation that things move very quickly mm. um, and uh a lot of the time, what comes with that is um, having to decide, we have just these few resources. And so what is the best way in which we're going to use those resources in order to achieve our results? And uh, that's a constant question because there's always a trade off. And so I think that's where clarity really, really comes in is really having being able to decide, how do I prioritize? What do I prioritize? What's the first thing I need to do? What things can drop? So there's a whole piece around that. Objectively speaking, like what's the work we're gonna do and how do we get clarity around that? I think the other piece around clarity though is really around just the individuals who are trying to do this, especially the leaders. A lot of the time, at least in tech, you have first time founders, first time you know, CTO, CPO, whoever it is, all of these, the, a lot of the executives are not just first time, but they're also very young um, and they don't have a lot of experience and um, mm. they're super smart and you're right they've identified this problem that's extremely important and they, they're trying to go after it 
but at the same time, they haven't necessarily come to a place where they can even just separate their own identity from the success of this the, the business, right? So there's a lot of themselves that is tied up inside the business. Mm. And I think that's especially true in a startup. There's just, you're so investing so much of yourself, um, whether you're a founder or not, you just kind of, you're putting a lot into it because there's so much potential that you could get out of it. And so I think along with that comes a lot of just the internal struggle of, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right choices? Am I helping my team correctly? Um, do they see me in the way that I need them to? Do they respect me? Do they, um, you know, did I impress them? There's just so much of this extra stuff that people are bringing to the conversations and to, you know, pitches and to sales, you know, sales conversations and to even management conversations. So I think that's the other place where clarity is really key in that environment. Mm. Gosh, I've heard, I've heard so many things so far that you could you could approach it the same thing in different ways and it would have a hugely different impact. So like when you talk about limited resources, um, you know, that's, I imagine there's founders and startup people who are like bemoaning that and wishing they had, you know, a Google budget or an Apple budget or, or the, the VC would, would open their purse. Um, and yet I know that, you know, the startups that I know looking that succeeded looking back are like thank god we had limited resources because it forced us to be creative mm -hmm. to come up with something new instead of just you know going with the first thing we thought of yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's a really good point i mean it's it's true because the resources resources can create a kind of almost safety net that allows you to just sort of stay where you are and not have to move outside of your comfort zone. And uh, it's constraints are what make problems more interesting and exciting and solutions more innovative. Yeah. yeah and another one is this, this sort of expectation of speed and success based on, you know, these storied companies and, to, you know, it's very inspiring to see these unicorns and to, to hear their stories and you go to tech meets and one of the founders is there and you know, you're like, oh, I just, you know, I kind of touch your jacket and get yeah. some of the mojo, whatever it is. But at the same time, it's like when I, um, um, you know, I played ultimate, I played ultimate Frisbee uh, all through my life. I started playing, you know, in junior high and it wasn't a sport that was on television. There wasn't, you know, we didn't have trading cards. So I didn't know people who were much better than me, <laughs> you know, but if, but when I looked at basketball or tennis, other sports that I played, yeah. there were people I could never touch. And, and, but when I couldn't, you know, shoot the ball like Bill Bradley or, or hit a backhand like Arthur Ashe, I would get down on myself because of the comparison. So I'm wondering, you know, it seems like that's also double-edged seeing all these superstar startups and com comparing yourself in ways that could be helpful or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that word double-edged, that's, that's maybe true about every, every situation in life, right? That there's always a different perspective we can wear when we, when we look at the situation and you're absolutely right. Like when there's, we have all kinds of opportunities to be inspired by and learn from and get curious about people who have had more success than us. And yet there's another part of ourselves, like there's kind of this energy inside of ourselves that's that biological fight or flight energy that's that's thinks that, you know, it's survival of the fittest. Like if they're successful, I can't be. Like almost that there's, it's a zero sum game when it isn't. And so mm. I think that, that that aspect of how do we work on our own perspective or even just decide what glasses am I going to wear in this situation so that it's helping me to compare or it's helping me to see these other people or talk to these people. Um, and how, and how can I kind of learn the tools to notice when I'm wearing a pair of glasses that's not serving me and how, and learn how to swap them out. I think that's, that's really the work um, that every individual needs to be able to do to really be successful because if we're wearing these glasses that tell us that it's like success is scarce and resources are scarce and money is scarce and you know potential is scarce like if we if we have that belief um we're really we're holding ourselves back and then we don't have the opportunity to unlock as much of our potential as as um as we have 
Yeah, and then another thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, how irrationally optimistic should we be? I've read studies that, you know, some of the best CEOs had the, 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 the loosest grip on reality and they were sort of able to bend it to their will and get other people to believe in a vision that was frankly crazy, you know, sort of it's impossible until it's done. Yeah. Um, do you see that a lot in your work? The people wondering like how, how much should I be realistic versus optimistic? I think that is, is a, um, it is a, a balance that you have to strike. Um, the way I like to think about it is really, um, for every situation, we have a choice as to what, how we want to approach it. And so if you think about every situation as being a leadership opportunity where there's some influence that's going to occur in one direction or the other, you have the opportunity to decide, like, what's that lens, what's that perspective or approach I'm going to bring to it. And so in the example that you're talking about, like, there's... And I'm not saying like we have to kind of run a pros and cons list every time. It's not it's not about being over overly analytical, but there's also just like being more conscious to see like an approach where I'm more realistic or take more. If if I'm if I'm you know too far on the realism spectrum here, um, there's people here that are gonna not be motivated or they're not gonna. It's gonna impact their morale in some way or inspect. They're not gonna be inspired enough. At the same time, mm. if I'm way over here. And they're just like the people I'm trying to influence are really kind of stuck in the day-to-day -day drudgery of whatever it is they're doing. Um, if there's if if you're if you're meeting them at a too high of a level, they're not going to come along on the ride. And so you kind of have to figure out where is the person that I'm trying to influence or talk to, and then have that awareness to understand like okay, where must they be, and have the curiosity to understand like why why are they where they are, and mm -hmm. try to meet them where they are. Uh -huh. And so I think that that's that's that idea of the conscious conscious choice or conscious leadership is kind of recognizing you have a lot of different options and different ones are going to serve you in different ways. And so try to meet them where they are and then move them up to that place of feeling very inspired. Yeah. Is, is it hard to um, be authentic when you're, when you're trying to be that strategic? Yeah, that's a good question. And I can see how the way in which I described that, it almost it almost um, implies a bit of manip like being a bit manipulative, right? Like that, or, or at least at least being a chameleon. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't. I think the key to all of that and the key to being authentic is to actually truly find the curiosity around where the person is. To, to be truly curious about where the people you're working with are coming from. Um, mm. And so in a situation, for example, where um, let's just say you have to give feedback to somebody on your team and um, you have to be, you know, you want to keep them inspired um, to keep working. At the same time, you have to be realistic about the fact that what they did is not achieving the results they need to. Right. And so it's like, you're trying to, uh, strike that balance between the, the real, the real bit and the inspiration, inspirational bit. And if you, if you overcorrect and you say like, okay, well, I don't want to kill their morale and I really want to keep them inspired the way in which you give the feedback, it's possibly going to do great in terms of keeping them inspired, but they're probably going to keep doing the thing that they, mm. they're, they're doing, right. They, they may not, it may not land. Um, and vice versa, right. If you, if um, you're so real and that they lose all kind of morale or that, that inspiration, uh, if, if they feel totally uninspired, they're going to disengage and then you've got the other problem. They're, they're just going to take that feedback really harshly. Um, and so the goal is basically to, before you kind of decide, this is what I'm, you know, it's not like you're coming into a conversation and saying, okay, well, this is the mask that I'm going to wear, right? Instead mm -hmm. of that, you're coming into the conversation and saying, let me try and understand, like, what is it, like, what, but let's get curious about what it is that they have been doing, why they've been doing it that particular way, um, what's what's been driving that, what's been driving their actions and the way their choices, and you're bringing a lot more curiosity to it, then you really truly are kind of just like hearing them out and helping them hear, feel heard and seen. And so then moving the conversation from there, 
I think it almost naturally flows that you're going to meet them where they are. And so it's not inauthentic. It's actually extremely authentic because you're not coming in from a place of judgment of like, I need to judge your behavior and make you do it a different way. You're actually coming in from a perspective of, let me understand, um, let me understand what it is that you're doing and how you're doing it. And, and, um, and also give you the feedback you need um, in order to move, move forward. Yeah, yeah. I have a personal question for you, which is when you were working in startups, were you ever on the giving or receiving end of feedback like that that was sort of corrective or? Yeah, I mean, both. Um, both do, you have, do, you have any, do you have any stories of how, you know, when you were on the receiving end of how it was done well or how it was done poorly? It's a good question. I'm trying to think now. It feels like ages ago. Um, I'm trying to think of like a specific situation. Um, where, um, yeah, I think that it was towards the end of my, um, the stint that I, the, my last stint, that when I ended up leaving, um, that I think it was Maybe this was a, I mean, this, this is just an example that's coming to mind. I don't know if it's quite in the feedback realm, um, but um, it was a kind of a tough situation at the company where I was, I was uh, leading the product team and a lot of changes were happening. And a couple of the core original members of the team had left uh, or had made mm. a decision to leave. And a new uh, head of the company was being, was kind of, um, somebody was stepping up and becoming kind of our new CEO and everything like that. So it was a lot of changes. And during that time, we, I think we also likely, it was either really close to some layoffs as well. So just a lot of change in the company. Right. And I was already on the executive team and a couple of people on the executive team are now stepping away. And I never felt like I committed fully to staying. Right. So I never out loud committed. And um, this comes up for me often as I, as I reflect back on it, especially as like so many different companies are going through layoffs right now. And we think so much about the people who are getting laid off, but also the people who are staying, you're almost committing to staying at a new company, right? Mm. And that, that this is, this is a new environment, a new everything. And are you in? And I, and I feel like if I had been asked clearly, like, Hey, this is hard people you know and have worked with are leaving, they're choosing to leave, are you choosing to stay? Um, and I wish that, that conversation had been explicit, but because it hadn't been and because it wasn't, um, I stayed on for a good maybe four, six months even, um, half committed without even realizing I was half committed. And mm. so just having like, it wasn't, you know, I think it wasn't just top of mind. A lot of the time we don't want to get curious about some of these things with our colleagues because we think it's going to unserve us of stuff that we don't want to deal, deal with. They're like, oh, they seem fine, so I'm just not going to touch that. But if I think that if they had actually kind of made me dig deeper, even if I had decided, no, I'm leaving, it would have been better for the company. Mm. And it definitely would have been better for me in terms of the six months. I think that's maybe an example of, a situation where I realize now that curiosity, even if it was, you know, going to unearth some stuff that you maybe don't want to deal with, it's still, it's still worthwhile. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, that's so common just in workplaces that, and in families and in like, yeah. and it's, it's kind of, it's the opposite of curiosity, which as I understand it is sort of the DNA of entrepreneurship in general. Like, you know, you want to find out like, before you build it, like, are they going to buy this? Will mm -hmm. they want it? Do they want it in blue? Is this a big enough problem that they care about? And, you know, startup entrepreneurs are so trained to ask those questions, to do bottom up research, to be voracious. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, but when it's about uh, yeah. people we know <laughs> and feelings. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So how, how do you, how do you help people? Um, when they, you know, you, I'm, I'm imagining you can walk into a, to a, a, a startup or company you're working with, spend 10 minutes there and, t and know if there are unsaid hard things. 
Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think that there's almost always an unsaid hard thing somewhere. I think it's so first of all, like, why do we even call it hard? Right. I mean, we talk about having to have hard conversations or say hard things or do hard things and all of that. Like the reason it's hard is because the truth is we're feeling a lot of feelings that are uncomfortable and hard to feel. And that's why we're calling it hard at all. Right. A feedback conversation isn't naturally hard. It's hard because you feel really reluctant to give that feedback or you're afraid of how they're going to react or you're not so sure that it's their fault and you think it might be yours. Like there's all this stuff that you're carrying, mm. right? So all of those emotions. And so primarily when I'm working, especially with leaders one-on-one -on -one, and they're bringing these challenges to our conversation, um, the, first, the first step is really to help them express how they actually feel. Um, and so it's building that... Um, I like to use the word emotional clarity around like, how does it actually feel for you to be doing this? And um, what, what is actually going on here? Like what, what is holding you back from wanting to have that conversation? Right. Mm. And that even being able to just have, have and articulate those emotions that are coming up itself is, is the first step to releasing them. Um, so emotions as they're, uh, expressed and acknowledged they are able to pass and as long as they're resistant um, they persist and so even just kind of allowing and creating a safe space for people to go there and to recognize that emotions are okay and we can feel them and it's good to talk about them and all of that helps helps process them along the way and so that's how i'm helping the people that i'm working with and helping them get cleared in what it is they need to say or do but then a lot of the time, I'm also helping them use these tools with people on their teams as well. Mm -hmm. So allowing them to then acknowledge or helping them, teaching them to acknowledge and validate their colleagues' emotions or maybe their direct reports or sometimes even their manager to kind of see it from their perspective and validate it for them so that their colleagues can also release those emotions in such a way that they have a more productive conversation. Mm -hmm. This is so interesting because I did not think we were going here. I thought we were going to talk about sort of strategies and, you know, but like, like coming back to this like really basic human thing of right, feelings that we don't want to feel and that, that keep us from doing the things that we need to do. I'm curious to, when, when you start working with people, is that what you lead with or do you have to lead with more? Like we're going to do strategy, and and then sort of the the emotions is like this Trojan horse because they're you know they're too macho to or analytical to admit that they have these feelings. Mm, that's a great question. I think I I'm somewhere right in the middle. I don't definitely don't lead with emotions, but I'm also not leading straight up saying like, hey, I'm gonna you know help you or help you build a business strategy. Um, I'm uh, I'm very clearly kind of in the middle there around let's get let's get stuff done so sometimes it's just about like progress or prioritization um sometimes it's about but I'll, often it's about like team dynamics and team conflict and helping resolve some of that um and then uh really helping them kind of we have to get to a place where there is comfort and enough trust and comfort built in our conversation or in our relationship so that i can go to a place where we're talking about emotions and um you know it's interesting because the, the framework that I am trained in and that I use, it's um, called energy, energy leadership, and it's really around energy. And so we can kind of talk about emotions almost from this biological perspective. Uh, um, and that often appeals to the tech leader <laughs> types mm. um, and, and it, it, it appeals in a way where it's just, it's really just helping kind of see the science behind what's going on and recognizing just emotions are just, they're just part of our, there's a physiological reason this is happening and there's physiological ways for us to process it and things like that. And so that can sometimes help as well. Oh, I'm, I'm real curious about energy leadership as I've never heard of that. Um, when did you discover it? Was it for sort of personal use first or? Yeah. So um, my story of how I ended up as a coach is actually that I was leading the startup that I was talking about. I was uh, leading the product team at a startup um, most recently. And it, this is at this point, I think I'm, we we're talking five years ago um, when I actually worked with a coach um, and to deal with the challenges that I was myself facing. And that was very transformational for me because I was starting to realize just how much I 
hadn't known or thought about or reflected on my own leadership style. And uh, it felt very like a, it, I was able to release quite a bit and be able to bring my better self there. It also helped me unlock the clarity that that was not the right goal for me. Um, but after I left, um, I was almost <laughs> shopping around for something that a, a role that made more sense for me. And by shopping, it was, it was all inside me. I knew that there was something that was lacking that I was looking for. Uh, and so I happened to sign up. I, I happened to meet a lot of coaches in my life around then and uh, was encouraged to just sign up for a course. And so the course that I ended up signing up for as a coach training program, just to see if I was interested, was Energy Leadership. And it's, it's offered through um, IPEC is the name of the coaching school, IPEC. And um, they, the first day of that course, it was like, it just became, they introduced this framework and it was crystal clear to me that this is what I wanted to be doing in my life. And this is, ah. the way to be, this is how I wanted to be supporting startups and stay in the tech world. But this was kind of the, the, the lens that I wanted to be able to bring to startups from, from then on. So I started my coaching practice right along along the, alongside that uh, um, training. And now it's five years. Wow. Okay. Well, so what, what do you find valuable about it? So um, the energy leadership framework um, essentially looks at this idea of perception and it makes it very tangible. And so every situation that we're in, we're perceiving it in some way. And again, it's like coming back to that metaphor around the glasses. It's like we're wearing a certain pair of lenses every time we look at a situation and we always have the ability to swap them out. And so this framework actually just lays out very clearly seven different lenses that we bring to any situation. And we can essentially label and find ourselves in any one of those seven phases in any, any given situation. And so, and, and so there's an assessment that I do with my clients at the beginning where they can actually take it and they can get a sense of like, where on those seven levels, like which of them, which of those energies is most prominent in the way, in their mm -hmm. leadership style. Um, but it's a point in time measure. So it is also very much like if once you've learned all of the different knobs that you can turn, you can choose where you want to be on this ladder at any given time. And so uh, essentially the basis of it is around the energy that we're bringing to a situation. We have, we have two types of energy, catabolic and anabolic. And catabolic energy is like biologically, it's the breaking down of uh, cells and tissues. For example, like if you break a bone, um, you're, it, it swells up over there because your body is breaking down cells and tissues and sending it over to that place where it's broken to protect it from further, um, further injury. And uh, our mind is doing the same thing. When we see a stressor in the environment, we're essentially saying, let me put all my resources onto that one stressor so that we can deal with that stressor in whatever way possible, fight, flee, um, et cetera, right? And so that's what catabolic energy has us do. But what it does is it focuses us entirely on the stressor. And so we lose sight of the bigger picture. But when we don't experience ourselves as being under stress, if we don't see a, a factor, a stress factor in our lives, if we're not perceiving a situation as stressful, we can unlock anabolic hormones, essentially, like the, the endorphins or the, the ones that are basically helping us not just deal with a problem, but um, deal with it in the op optimal way. So what's the best way forward? And so we're able to kind of open up a more holistic approach to say, like, um, of all my choices, what's the best one that's going to help me address this in the best way? So when you bring this lens back to, a, say, a conflict with a colleague, if you're looking at that conflict and all you can think about is, like, how do I either fight my colleague or avoid them completely um you're whatever happens you're not gonna you're either gonna lose a relationship or you're gonna lose your cause right but if you're looking at the situation saying what's my best possible approach with this colleague for us both to win and for us to maintain the relationship um you have so many more opportunities to you have you have a lot more choices as to how you can approach that and ultimately it's going to serve you in the long run mm. if that makes sense yeah, yeah, I can see how, how that, um, the, you know, the really heavy leaning on biological metaphors would appeal to, uh, to tech people. Um, so are the, are the seven lenses, some of them are catabolic and some of them are anabolic, or are they all anabolic? Yeah, yeah, it's basically a gradient. So you're going from 100% catabolic to 100% anabolic. You can also think about it as like, 
the, the, the first two essentially are the catabolic ones, the three through seven are anabolic. Um, but it's, you're slowly moving up the chain. Um, uh -huh. and you're, you're moving from a place of like full 100% judgment in, that, the, in the bottom to 100% non-judgment on the outside. So you can kind of think about that as a, another uh -huh. label for the, for the axes there. Gotcha. And is the idea that everyone wants to, you want to get to 100% non-judgmental or is it situational? It is situational. None of the levels are actually inherently bad and each one has, each one serves us in some way. So the whole point of the work is really to be able to choose them, uh, choose, to choose rather than default to any of these. So it's like uh -huh. making conscious choice is actually really the goal of all, the goal of all this work. Gotcha. So when people take the assessment, it, but it gives them sort of a gravity, like this is where you live since it's a gradient. This is sort of where you tend to live as a default without thinking, you know, without thinking or trying too hard to be something else. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it actually even shows us um, this is where you tend to live on a good day. And this is where you tend to live when you're stressed. So you actually ah. get two, two different maps of, uh -huh. of your energies and then um, but again, recognizing that they're all just levers that you can pull at, at will once you have enough awareness around them. Uh -huh. Do you find that awareness is enough? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about like, you know, practice, awareness, and then, you know, when you're talking about the stress system, my perception of a threat might be very different from your perception of a threat. And if I, you know, if I see someone talking to me and it reminds me of how my father used to talk to me, yeah. you know, it might trigger me in ways that, you know, you would be like, oh, he's just blowing off steam. No yeah. big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So I think awareness is huge. I would say maybe awareness gets us like 80 percent of the way. Right. Because in that moment, if you can just recognize that, hey, I'm thinking of this person and this person reminds me of my father. Right. Just even being able to have that that awareness, that, that mindfulness in that moment to say, this is, this is why I'm getting triggered and who they remind me of. It allows you almost immediately to pop out of it and say like, Oh, but they're not, they're not my father. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, or I'm unnecessarily judging them and that's what's creating stress. Like, but, but there is that first step, which is just even recognizing that it's happening. I think then after that, maybe it's, I've never really thought about it, but maybe intention, really like, having the intention to make it different to, to have that situation serve you. So having the intention to not experience stress in that moment or not uh, engage in a way that you don't want to. Uh, and then of course, yes, it takes practice. <laughs> so much practice and don't I know it. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Ooh, I, feel, I feel like you just created a pink sheet for me. <laughs> yes. Great. <laughs> Tell me about it. So sort of, you know, awareness, intention, practice, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I'm seeing a Venn diagram. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm curious about how you help people pass it along to like, are, are you thinking of it in terms of was people move up towards more and more um, an anabolic that it becomes sort of emotional contagion to a certain extent, even if the person you're working with isn't the leader, isn't the CEO, that their shift kind of changes the, the energy of the system. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that you picked up on that. And, and I'm sure that that's exactly right. Like energy, there's one, uh, uh, I guess a foundation principle that we learned through this practice, which is the energy attracts like energy. And, hmm. um, I think about it as like, you know, there's just a, a metaphor. I, as a family, we often go and play pickleball, which is, you know, super popular. Um, and uh, my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, she was, I was observing her play with my husband. And, you know, her goal is to just get the, the, uh, hit the ball as hard as possible. And his, yeah. goal, his goal is to um, keep a, as long a, a rally as possible, right? And so, mm -hmm. so every time she's hitting it as hard as she can in whatever direction, he's hitting it back up, you know, like swinging upward. So that slows down the ball and comes over to her and then she's uh -huh. walking in another direction. And so like, eventually, like she kind of just, you know, his energy, which is very consistent and continuous to bring the, the, the slow down the ball and just extend this rally. Eventually she just kind of picked up and, and flowed right into that same, into that same rhythm. 
and it was just reminding me of that kind of conversation where if you can stay very consistent and you can just hold on to that anabolic perspective in a conflict when somebody's kind of just like being aggressive or you know hitting it as hard as possible or just trying to get their way um eventually you will bring them back like if you can, can stay consistent with your curiosity and with, with whatever it is that, that, that the calm that you're bringing to the conversation and hold yourself from being triggered um you eventually bring them along and so that's not just in one conversation right that that will trickle out into um the whole culture of the company as well mm, what, a, what a great example it, uh... A book that I have always meant to read, read and have not yet read is James Carr's Finite and Infinite Games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Same here. <laughs> it's on my list. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Maybe we can talk in a month of having, yes, having exactly. read it. Let's, let's, um, yeah, let's follow up on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, can, you know, I, I feel that. So I'm um, a personal example, not about a startup, but just in my life. Um, People think of me who know me sort of in, uh, professionally, they think of me as very calm and, and maybe even having some gravitas, which is nice because they don't see me like fly off the handle mm -hmm. in life, yeah. which I used to do a lot and I do it less, but I still, I still have the, the urges. It's like certain things like, you know, I was, I'm trying to get some documentation from our bank yeah. so that the, uh, the accountant can pull on it to do Spanish taxes here. And I, don't, mm -hmm. and I walk in and I'm showing them all the documents and they say, Oh no, it does. It's, it's not going to work. We can't do it. And finally, you know, I'm showing them Google translate stuff from the accountant and like, okay, come back tomorrow morning, uh, bring your wife and then we'll do it. Yeah. And next morning I drag her out and we are sitting yeah. down there. And the person looks at it, the same person who helped us yesterday and looked at it and says, oh, no, we, we can't do it. And at this point, I can feel the, yeah. the, the steam, you know, yeah. filling up in the boiler. And, and I, I, I don't behave badly, but I, my wife can tell. Like, I'm like, but you told us to come back. Yeah. Right. So which is a perfectly true statement and perfectly unhelpful. And the energy in which I say it is perfectly unhelpful, but it's, it's like it cannot not come out. Yeah. And then my wife takes over and she, and she starts complimenting like the woman's hair. And, and, and then and eventually we get what we need because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I still, you know, I'm almost 59 years old and I still don't have a hundred percent control over what you would, you would think would be like, okay, I, I am here to be strategic. I'm trying to get a thing done. And I know that being ornery in a, in, in a language that's not my own is not going to help me. Yeah. And I want, I wonder if, the, you know, if as a, as a coach who works on people's emotions, if you have any thoughts or reflections on, on that story. Yeah. Yeah. And I can relate to it so, so much as well. I mean, and, um, you know, I, I think that even as you're talking about this and you're talking about yourself in that situation, that, that you're holding a lot of judgment towards yourself around how you're reacting there. And so like, I think that's the first thing I'm just noticing um, because the frustration or the anger that you're feeling in that moment is completely valid and, and mm. it's completely valid. Like you, it's, it's your time. Uh, you've dragged your wife out there as well. You've done this multiple times. You, you expectations were set and now they're being yanked out at, at, from under you. And so everything's being changed on you. And I think the response or like feeling frustrated by this is a perfectly normal response. Mm. So even just being able to recognize that and acknowledge and validate, like it's okay for me to feel this upset. Um, mm. It's the first step right? and just be okay with that. Like, yes. Whether you're, you know, 16 or 59, it doesn't, or, or 72, it doesn't matter. Right. Like this is just going to be, this is, we are human and we feel emotions. Um, there's this uh, beautiful poem, Rumi poem, about just inviting all, I think it's called the, the guest house. Uh-huh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, about just inviting every emotion into your home and as if they're a guest, right, and treating them as, 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 as equal. 
Uh, and in the same way, it's just being able to kind of acknowledge and validate that that feeling is there and it's okay. And so that part of that is just the awareness that, I, now, it's very likely that you had never set an intention for showing up in that in that conversation um, in a different way or to get, you know, like the intentionality to approach it in a different way was just not there in that moment, in that context. Yeah. Whereas it probably exists, you have an intention to not blow up out of that frustration with other people in your life, right? And so it's really just about kind of knowing and, and, and developing more practice in some of those different ways. Yeah. But I mean, I, ha I have a generalized intention yeah. that every, everyone I meet comes away enhanced, right? Like I, but, I, but I don't, like I didn't prime myself yes. for it. Like I could, you know, I could literally go four months and, and go, oh yeah, I remember that that's how, like a really important thing that I said. Yeah, yeah. You know, so may, I'm, hear, I'm hearing almost the need for some kind of ritual. Um, do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I think, again, so that, that just comes back to the practice piece. So um, we, we want to be able to notice when these emotions are coming up. We want to be able to accept them. But then the next bit of it is really about uh, intentionally choosing our actions in a way that's aligned with those emotions and in a way that's going to serve us in that moment. And um, just in general, having a mindfulness practice of any kind um, where we acknowledge and notice the feelings we're feeling and practice acceptance of them uh, eventually gets us to a place of being able to, um, again, be in a more conscious space when mm. we when we take action. Uh-huh. Yeah. Are, 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 do you meditate or do mindfulness stuff? I'm glad you're asking this question. I wish mm -hmm. I, so I attempt to meditate a lot. And uh -huh. it's something I'm still struggling with. So a lot of my practice, I find other ways to kind of get into that meditative state. <laughs> um, uh -huh. um, but it is, it is, I'm very much a work in progress, like just doing this alongside my clients at the same time. Uh huh. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty common for, you know, coaches to work on the things we need with other people, the things we need. Yeah, <laughs> totally. What about you? Uh -huh. Do you? Um, I was doing 20 minutes twice a day wow. and for, for several years and it's now down to 20 minutes in the morning and sometimes it's meditation and sometimes it's body scans and sometimes it's Qigong. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, I liked it better when I was doing it twice a day. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just articulating that mm -hmm. it's. It's felt like for several reasons, I think moving and then, you know, just, just being really late at night and working with clients. Like, I don't know, I guess it's uh, 21, 12. It's like almost one for you right now. It's uh, almost 10 for me. And so yeah. my day ends and I'm like, I'm not really in a, <laughs> like I, I, could, I could sit down and start drooling, but I don't know that I could like follow my... <laughs> Yeah. follow my breath or thoughts or count stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I am, I am thinking that it was doing it twice a day was better than doing it once a day. Yeah. And it's, I'm a little surprised to hear myself realizing that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing that you've had that commitment even for as long as you have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I don't have a nine-year-old, so <laughs> I have a little, a little more control over my mornings than, uh, than I used to. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, like there's, um, I, th I think there's lots of different ways to go about it. I don't recommend meditation as a, as a default for my clients. Um, I think that I think, you know, this idea of like, priming, whether it's an intention or journaling, yeah. or some sort of orientation or, um, you know, some something, I think it's almost more like these days, it's like the something where you're not on your phone for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's like probably the, the lowest bar, but also so true, even that can be so hard, but you're right. Yeah, just being able to have any kind of a practice where it's not a device, you're, you're walking, you're 
sitting here uh, writing, whatever it is. Um, it's so critical. It's so critical to just kind of come back to you carrying so much everywhere you go and just even come back. Sometimes, um, sometimes I have um, my clients just even keep a journal of um, the emotions they're feeling throughout the day just to like slowly build awareness around, okay, this is an emotion that's there and you, you don't get overcome by them because you can just articulate that they're there and it's, and it's okay for them to be there. Or sometimes it's even just keeping a journal of the judgment we're feeling. So judging another person or a situation or ourselves and just, just even just the little notch that like, you know, just like keeping a little tally um, of them. You don't need to write down what they are or anything like that. But again, it's just building that like extra layer of awareness around all of those processes that are going on in your mind. Mm. And, and I imagine that learning about, you know, the, the stress response and the biological basis, um, you know, gives people the opportunity for self-compassion that normalizes it. It's not like, what's wrong with me? It's like, oh, this is, this is how mind deals with perceived threat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So is... Um, startup entrepreneurship really just a Trojan horse for personal development and um, yeah I mean you know I don't I don't know that it's even a Trojan horse I think it's maybe a bit more uh, out in the open uh, just uh. in terms of my practice I think that um, the startup is just the context um, and I, I know about the context and so that's helpful um, with the people that I meet because I've worked there and I also recognize that there are certain aspects of a startup environment that create certain types of challenges that you might not see in other places. Um, but ultimately, for us to be successful in any situation, we need to be able to have conversations with people and influence them in some way or be, or be open to being influenced by them, right? And so having a comfortable relationship with our tough emotions having a comfortable relationship with uh, our, our own emotions as well as that those in others uh, is really what we need as a foundation to be able to make better decisions and quicker decisions and to set goals that are very specific and to say no to things that we, we can't do um, and to even just have, have the conversations we need to keep progress moving. And so that foundation is really that um, building the emotional clarity and then everything else goes off of that. Gotcha. Do you, have, do you have any good stories about just amazing leaders and what you've learned from them? Yeah. Um, gosh, I've, so many, <laughs> so many amazing leaders that I've been able to work with and um, I've learned so much just by working alongside them. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the little shifts that you see in them are gradual. And then sometimes you kind of look back and you think, wow, that's a huge, huge shift that they've created, right? And, uh, you know, I think that some of the, a couple of stories that I, a couple of kind of um, leaders that I've worked with have really started from a place of feeling a lot of self-judgment and all, like almost kind of hiding behind a mask of I'm an introvert. And so I don't, I don't, I don't really like meetings or I don't really like to engage or if they're trying to figure something out, I'd rather stay out of it, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, there's two different leaders that I've worked with in, in this specifically who kind of used those words when we first started working together. Um, but over time have kind of come to realize that as they're judging themselves around, um, as, as, the, as often what's happened is um, they're starting with this belief that uh, you know, it's not important to speak. It's not, you know, people are just speaking to have their voices heard. They just like to talk uh, for no reason. You know, they're just, you know, kind of have, holding a lot of judgment towards other people around um, the way in which they're approaching conversations, but then realizing that they're actually holding that judgment towards themselves as well. And that's stopping them from being able to actually be seen and heard and, and visible at their company. And so breaking through those patterns to get to a place of, um, really kind of taking ownership over a lot of the the strategy and the vision because it was just so much that that was that was there that they knew and understood and could see but they weren't really willing to talk about it and they weren't really willing to get into a place and have to kind of try to influence somebody else 
Um, but I've just seen so much growth and development happen uh, as a result of them recognizing like, what is all the judgment I'm holding towards other people? What's the judgment I'm holding towards, towards myself? What are these feelings that I'm feeling um, that are stopping me from actually contributing in these important strategic meetings to a place of, okay, I'm gonna raise my hand and say this thing to I'm gonna raise my hand and take on this initiative to I'm now going to set the vision and strategy for the company and bring everyone along. And I've just kind of been able to see that development over time. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's been just incredible. Uh, it's been just amazing to be able to witness that kind of growth and uh, change uh, over over months. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So is a lot of it, once, once there's the awareness, is a lot of it just courage to to do the thing that with and feel the feeling that you've been trying not to feel? Yeah. That's a good, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, Cause what is courage? It's, it's basically being able to take conscious action even in the presence of uncomfortable emotions. So yeah, mm. I think that's it. Yeah, I, I, I've never used that word to describe it, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's multiple steps. It's not just like, okay, I'm scared and now I'm courageous. It's, mm -hmm. I'm worried about these things for these reasons, but I'm willing to allow that feeling to be there and still create a vision for where I want to be and work backwards from that vision and take this step and take this next step and take this next step, all while holding space for this uncomfortable emotion that I've got. Yeah. Uh -huh. Gotcha. So I, I've worked with a bunch of startup founders. It's not my principal practice like it is with you, but I found that the, the hardest ones to work with are the ones who are on their second company because they you know, who, who succeeded with their first company and they think they know things. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if you, if you come across, you know, people who have had some degree, who have had like an amazing success and um, assume, you know, do some attribution of it's because I'm so clever, smart, brilliant, hardworking, deserving, as opposed to, you know, it's a fluke and it could just as easily not happen next time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I've um, encountered exactly that, that, um, that dynamic, but I think whether you're a first time or nth time founder, um, there is a level of willingness to reflect and build awareness and want to do things, want things to change, want to do things differently. That's essential for any of this work, any of this to work because mm. it's a partnership and I'm not in any relationship, just like I know that you understand this completely in your work as well. Like, we're not in this work to tell them the answers. We're there to help them unlock the choices they have and find the choice that makes the most sense for them. And so um, there is a degree of just sort of trust in something outside of oneself that has to be nurtured in order to be able to really lean into that process. Yeah, because it's, it's hard because in a lot of ways they are smarter Right. They, they know what it takes. They they're prepared for the dips that my other people might quit. They say, OK, you know, this isn't the end. This is how it goes. Um, and at the same time, I guess you're right. They're cultivating the curiosity and humility yeah. and awareness to see where this is different. Yeah. To see where my my old learnings might actually be getting in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just recognizing that we're holding on to these beliefs and um, um, there's an equal possibility that that belief will serve me or not serve me in a moment but I need to be able to look at that belief and uh, examine it as just its own thing outside of myself before I can even uh, before I can decide uh, it, before I before I just default to those patterns mm -hmm. right yeah. 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 So as I mentioned, it's getting late here. It's after 10. So yes. I'm, I'm, I don't want I don't want to fade on our time together. Um, how who who um, 
should reach out to you? How would, if someone's listening to this and they think, you know, maybe Divya could help me, or they think that someone that they know who's in a startup, like how, how do they think about whether they're a good fit for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, I do primarily work with tech startups, but it's, it is not the only group that I'm working with, but, but essentially who I'm working with are leaders at any stage at any kind of any kind who are working to, who are trying to get hard things done. And they're experiencing a lot of discomfort around either getting kind of big ambiguous tasks complete, or they're experiencing a lot of discomfort around having the conversations they need to in order to get other people to do hard things. Uh, and so this, I, like, like I said, my experience, the context that I know the best are these smaller companies where there's just a lot of fast paced movement. Everyone's wearing different hats um, or multiple hats at different times. And uh, just trying to get things done as quickly as possible. And uh, if you're like experiencing those kinds of challenges with other colleagues, with the team, with um, vision and just kind of trying to know how to move forward. I'd love to talk. I'd love to, love to please do reach out. I'd love to talk to you. Okay. So where can people find you on the web? Yes. Um, so the best place to connect with me is definitely on LinkedIn. Please feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Um, how will you be putting maybe some links in to your... Uh I will put links in, but not everybody reads the show notes, so I would definitely give people breadcrumbs right now. Okay, so uh, Divya Ramachandran is my name, um, and uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, and also my website is uh, divyalalitha.com, so I'm going to spell that for you. It's D-I-V-Y-A-L-A-L-I-T-H-A.com, and that's my website, and you can um, find me there, contact me through that or sign up for my weekly newsletter um, on that on my website as well um, so that you can kind of get a sense of the kind of work I do and uh, see if it's a good fit for you. All right. So I'm going to say one more time so to make sure that I wrote it down properly because I'm going to put it in the show notes. Uh, Divya Lalita, D-I-V-Y-A-L-A-L-I-T-H-A dot right. com. Mm -hmm. Okay. And your last name, uh, could you spell that as well? Yes, Divya Ramachandran is my last name, R-A-M-A-C-H-A-N-D-R-A-N. -A -A Excellent. So LinkedIn's the best place. And you also have a newsletter that people can uh, sign up for and get per pearls of wisdom on a weekly basis, right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah this is so, it's so cool that the, you know, I was really picturing you and me as doing completely different work. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it turns out like, you know, the, the DNA is really similar and you bring the credibility of this um, startup um, successive, um, you know, sort of events in your career that allow you to really understand that landscape, you know, in, in a way that, that gives, first of all, gives you a lot of credibility and second, it saves a lot of time and third, you don't end up making stupid comments like I white some, sometimes it's just, just from ignorance. Uh, but the basis of it is, is so similar. It's about human beings um, basically liberating ourselves from, from our conditioning yeah. to meet the moment. Yeah. Oh, beautifully said. Yes, absolutely. It's really nice so. to be able to identify some of those connections. Work. Yeah. Well, thank thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for for all you do to help uh, people birth good hard things in the world. Divya Ramachandran. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say say one more time. D i v y a l a l i t h a dot com. And so I'll be I'll put that in the show notes. So, so I don't know what number episode this will be yet, but if people just search for your first name Divya on Plant Yourself, they will find it because you're you're my first Divya. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was really a pleasure to talk to you and to your audience. Thanks, Howie. Cool. Catch you soon. And that's a wrap. Show notes at plantyourself.com slash 595. Movement news. Uh, got barking heels again. I seem to have developed some plantar fasciitis in both feet. So I'm returning to the advice that I got from Carly Assay, who's been a guest on the podcast a couple times. Uh, around alternating heel raises and 
uh, calf stretches. I've been doing that for a week now, and I think it's getting better. Uh, good news is playing ultimate on sand doesn't seem to trigger anything, so I'm just trying to be extra careful and doing more stretching than usual. Uh, it's been real hot here, so and we're looking for a, a little bit of a, a respite from the heat, so uh, be able to do more walks. And I've even started swimming a bit, which is hard for a, for a Leo like me to admit that getting into the water can be nice, but uh, hey, live and learn. So that's it for this week. I look forward to seeing you all again in a future episode, and as always, be well, my friend.